Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the uh, November meeting of the Grand Oaks Central Village Board of Education. Would you please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before we take the roll, as long as we have over here, we want to take this opportunity to wish you all a very healthy, happy Thanksgiving. We hope you enjoy the long holiday weekend since tomorrow is the first of several Fridays in a row. Uh, enjoy your home. Thanks for being here tonight. Now take the roll. Mr. Janice. Here. Mr. Miller. Here. Dr. Corman. Here. Ms. Deeds. Here. Mr. Brown. Excellent. All right, so the uh, first commendation that I'd like to uh, dole out tonight is for the GHS Girls Cross Country uh, team. So before I get into the details, I want to kind of set the stage for um, kind of a longer argument that I think I'm, Mr. Durst and I are going to get engaged in with OH, OHSAA. Um, it is around... Uh, the divisional alignment, okay? So I want to give some context to the accomplishment of the uh, girls cross country team. So they placed third place in the state in division one, okay? I want you to pay attention to the numbers that I'm gonna share. Beaver Creek, who came in first, has 866 girls eligible to run for their cross country team. Centerville, which finished second, has 974 girls that can run on their cross-country team. Granville has 326. Mason has 1,296. And Lakota East has 982. Okay? So the average is that, you know, we have about 703 less girls that are eligible to run on our cross-country team than our competitors that obviously from a divisional alignment standpoint um, doesn't make a lot of sense. So, um, but it only talks about the, the quality of this team that we have sitting here that competed. Um, the coach, Bart Smith and Chrissy Rogerson just did a fantastic job, as they always have. I mean, this is a perennial team. Uh, that uh, shows up at regional and at state every single year, and we love to see them participate. So now, I think we need to kind of advocate for a look at the divisional alignment um, by OHSAA. O -S o -S -A -A. Thank you. Craig, don't mess that up. <laughs> um, so this year's team, uh, qualified for the state meet uh, for their 10th consecutive season. Um, they did an excellent job representing Granville at the state meet on Saturday, November 10th. It was a little delayed. I bet you you're glad that you didn't run the week before, but it wasn't great weather the week that you ran either. It was pretty cold, wasn't it? So the girls placed third in the state at Division I. Riley Zink placed 20th overall and earned all Ohio. This is Granville's first Division I All Ohio Cross Country finish. Uh, we would like to commend the members of the team who competed in the state meet um, Riley Zink, Alyssa Christian, Dylan Kretschmar, uh, John Uncafer, Regina Rose, Emma Calvert, Tori Bergstrom, and the alternate was Avery Gullum. 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 Okay. And so, girls and coaches, please come up and receive your commendation. Five. 
Pinnacle, Ohio. Oh, even better. Come on up here. <laughs> Only because the other two were freshmen and they didn't qualify. Yes. Uh, <laughs> clarify. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep going. Yes. Which is right first. No, you're fine. One, two, three. I'm going to take two. One, two, three. Thank you. Over here. And this way. So this next combination is something that we haven't done in a while. Um, tonight we're commending Craig McDonald, uh, who has been recognized by the Ohio School Boards Association for their uh, media honor roll. Craig has been a reporter for the Newark Advocate and Granville Sentinel for many years. The media honor roll recognizes fair and balanced educational reporting and exemplary service to our community. So I'd like to congratulate Craig. Quite honestly, he spends a lot of nights when no one else is paying attention to you know, government work. He's out uh, covering the beat, and we appreciate his uh, fair and balanced approach. It's always good to have a great relationship with your local reporter. Um, it comes in handy in good times and in bad. And in a school district, we have both. So, um, Craig, thank you very much for your service and your media honor. So, Mr. Durst has to follow that. 
did you did you slip her a twenty on the comment about the no homework and then and then she got you back? <laughs> we might have spoken before. Uh, before she presented. Okay, so let me start by setting the stage. This is uh, the second State of the Students report uh, that we've provided to the board. Again, uh, it is related to um, the whole child committee and well-being task force. But something that we've actually done for many years is uh, look at exit survey data and um, risky uh, behavior survey data and try and make some actionable steps related to the information that's coming out from our student base. Uh, Kristen just mentioned one of the things that Mr. Durst has implemented. But we'll talk about several of those things throughout uh, the presentation. So Matt, did that give you ample time? I'm feeling good. All right. Good day. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you, as always, for the opportunity to opportunity to present um, some information to you. This, as Jeff said, is the second version um, of the Granville Exemption Village Schools State of the Students report. Um, you know that we've done this on the academic side for years and years and years um, with the State of the Schools, um, and this really, as Jeff mentioned, was born um, out of a couple of years of conversation about the ongoing wellness of our students. Um, so to frame the evening for us in terms of, of the information, um, as we move through this presentation, you're going to note that there are a variety of different sources that have been used to obtain the information that I'll be sharing with you. Uh, among these sources are annual exit surveys, oh yes survey results, um, and then additionally a few pieces from EMIS reporting data. Uh, EMIS is simply uh, the vehicle that moves data from the local level to the state level. Um, tonight we'll be talking about um, EMIS data like attendance rates, things like that. Uh, the exit surveys, just for your information, are administered every year. Uh, they're done right after spring break and they're given to students as they exit buildings. So think of grade 3, 6, 8, and 10. Um, and we've actually given them at that time since 2013. So this will be the sixth round um, of, ex of exit surveys um, in that current format. The OES survey was new to the district in 2016, so we've got two administrations. Uh, it has replaced the previously used PRIDE survey. The PRIDE survey was a little more narrow in focus, and some of the developers um, of the OES instrument actually came from uh, the Lincoln County area. David Edelblut was one who had a strong voice um, in the development of OES, um, and they developed a more comprehensive instrument that really um, does a much better job of surveying a wider variety um, of topics. Um, I've provided some things there in front of you, um, and I want to walk through those very quickly. I've given you a printed copy of the presentation that I'm going to be walking through tonight. I've also given you the OES survey document, just in case you want to reference the questions that are asked specifically. Now keep in mind that it's not a paper survey that, that our students take. It is a no-cost survey. It's free for students. Um, it's, it's actually housed with the Ohio Department of Health. Um, and funded by a number of, of state organizations and agencies. Um, but the, the OES, when the students take it, is an online instrument. It's a web-based survey. Um, the paper copy you have there in front of you is simply to reflect the questions that are used or asked. And then finally, the OES re uh, results report, uh, you should have two of them, one for the 16 <coughs> and one for the 17-18 school years. Um, last year when we spoke, there simply was not a report available in that form. Uh, we, we are benefiting um, across the state, really, from the work that Ohio University has done in compiling these results um, for us. Um, and so what you're going to see there is, like I said, 16, 17, and then also 17, 18, um, but they've got a breakdown of the way that our students responded. Last year at this time, uh, we really had pulled this information by hand. Um, and so we were just creating this information. Uh, so it's the same data. <coughs> It's presented in a different way, okay? So last year when we were pulling this, we actually pulled this by grade level. The information that OU has put together for you is not done by grade level in, in most of those tables that you're going to see. They've done it as uh, a comprehensive look at grades seven through 12 as one unit rather than as a grade level. Um, so Mr. Bernal and I went through and we actually cherry picked data from, from the OES um, data warehouse so that we could update the grade level information. But again, just understand that the grade level information is not necessarily going to be presented the same way as those written reports that are
go there in front of you. And then finally, before we move into this information, as you have questions, please feel free to ask. Um, I'm someone who has to ask it right away, or the question needs my mind. <coughs> so please feel, feel, feel free to interrupt, um, and then I can get those questions answered as we go along. Okay? Um, again, you see up there on the screen um, those reflections of the sources of information. Um, and then let's just jump directly into what the numbers tell us. Um, first, we're going to set this concept, context. So students attend school on a consistent basis. Students in Granville attend school at a very high rate. You can see that reflected in the numbers in front of you. I will tell you that we do have attendance issues. I don't want to paint the wrong picture here. We do have students that struggle with attendance issues, but I would say that those are definitely the norm rather than, or excuse me, those are the exception rather than the norm. Um, I think we're prone to see attendance as an expectation in Granville. We're going to get sucked into that trap if we're not careful. But I believe we should acknowledge that this is definitely a luxury for us that other districts do not have. And it, I think it comes from a strong sense of community support. Uh, I think our parents value the education that students are receiving. And so the result then is that they prioritize attendance and they make it a point for students to attend. Our students feel physically safe at school. I think one of the reasons that our students do attend high rates is because they feel both physically and emotionally safe at school. Uh, like I said, we're far from perfect. We do have attendance issues. We do have uh, other issues that do pop up. But it's obvious based on student perception of physical and emotional safety that our students are comfortable in our buildings. Uh, they feel safe in our buildings and they feel supported in our buildings. Now as you look at the numbers moving from left to right, please remember that this survey was given to students in April of 2018. So to provide greater context for that time frame, Parkland uh, and the, the shootings in Florida had occurred on February 14th. So you're looking at six weeks in between um, a pretty uh, serious school shooting uh, and then the administration of these exit surveys. Just a few weeks prior in March, um, we actually saw nationwide walkouts done by students um, in the name of student and, or, excuse me, a, a student and school safety. Um, I do think, and this is just a hypothesis, I have nothing to back this up, but this is, this is a hypothesis that this is reflected in an emotional safety um, as we look, again, from left to right. Um, this will be one of those numbers that we continue to look at. Um, we would expect a rebound next year, um, but it, al it is also clear that our students are impacted by national events, uh, and that's something that maybe is a good reminder for us, and that we do see that reflected in those numbers. So Matt, how should we think about like statistically like how accurate these numbers are? Should we be is there a number based on the number of responses? Like if it's within a couple points, it's okay, or how way? Do you mean like statistical significance? Like, yeah, like I mean yeah. point two is not probably significant. No, it's not. Is, like how do we kind of get our arms around that just as we think about the Well, data? I think first of all, you know, everything that we've always looked at has been trend data, you know, where we, we create, you know, typically a three year average to try and create that yeah. longitudinal look because there's going to be a variation from year to year, you know, um, and so we don't want to overreact or underreact to a, a specific change. But once we kind of look at a three-year trend and, and see, okay, what is what's stable about these numbers or not, um, then we'll be able to make better decisions uh, related to them. But Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to point out that if you look at the, at the intermediate school number, you know, they dropped 2.5%. 2.5% is five kids out of a class of 200. So uh, that's not anything that's statistically significant. Okay. Now, I'm also not a statistician, and so I'm not going to make claims that I don't believe we support it, but five students out of 200, to, to me, uh, that doesn't represent a significant impact for movement. We might have a person on the board that has a <laughs> background in that. So. Tom, yeah. Yeah. when you look through the yeah. VISTA, it also uh, references how many did not respond to a particular question. Yeah. And that yeah. might give you a better sense of if there right. is something that might be an outlier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you for mentioning that. That's something that the whole child committee discussed last week when we met. Um, and that will actually come up um, in some of the suicide information that we're going to talk about later, um, or that suicidal ideation information. So, so we, will, we will actually reference that directly. 
Uh, this is a slide of information that I would suggest that we take maybe the most uh, or the greatest amount of pride in. Um, this notion that students feel comfortable talking to an adult at the school. And what you can see there across the district is that more than 8 out of 10 students in the district feel comfortable approaching an adult and speaking with an adult at school. Um, the staff from each building, I would say, works persistently and works very intentionally to establish relationships with each student and they make connections with them. Um, over the last few years, uh, the board has actually heard some very specific examples of things like My Inside Connection and GIS, efforts that we have really developed in, a, in an attempt to see this number uh, reflected in a positive way. Um, obviously, it's more than just for this number um, to establish those relationships, but this is a benefit for those things. Um, one of the reasons that our schools are not plagued by bullying, harassment, um, and suspension is that our students see school as a positive experience. They are connected to adults, they feel safe, they are challenged academically, they are engaged. And as I've said before, we're not perfect. Bullying does happen. Situations with discipline do pop up. Um, but when that happens, um, it's addressed. Families are supportive. Students make these into learning experiences. Um, and I believe that, uh, that, again, those would be the exception rather than the norm. Can we not ask this question in secret? We have not for the last couple of years asked this at the high school level, no. Any particular reason? No, no particular reason. Okay. Anything else similar? Because I, mean, I know the questions vary because it's, it's right. like, you know. Right. right. No, there, there's not really a fair comparable that we've got on that list of questions for the seniors. This slide really dives into um, the amount of connection or connectedness or involvement our students have with extracurriculars. Um, this number being 90%, it only includes, and, and please hear this, it only includes school-based extracurriculars. This is, again, EMIS reporting data where we uh, solicit what's called a membership, uh, basically a roster of students who are connected to an extracurricular, um, and what we build is a database um, of how connected our students are in terms of any extracurricular event that they're included in. So you see there that in grades 7 through 12, 9 out of 10 students are connected to a school-based extracurricular. It could be more than one. This is just simply representing at least one school-based extracurricular. Things like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, youth groups at churches, club sports, um, these are not included in this number, so we can make um, a pretty conservative assumption that this is actually higher than 90% across the community. Um, to that end, we know from the OES survey that more than 75% of our students are involved at least weekly in an organized activity that is not a sports team. So of that 10 that we don't have included, we know with confidence that 75% are connected somewhere in the community. Um, so here's your, here's your context. Here's a quick summary statement for the context of the students. They attend school at a high rate. They feel emotionally and physically safe in our buildings. They are connected to adults and to activities. Um, ideally, I could leave the microphone at this point. <coughs> that would be more fun for us. Um, but given all the positives, uh, our students face challenges. This is real life for these students. So I want to walk you through some of these challenges uh, that we believe are the most salient um, in the upcoming slides. Our students carry a great deal of stress. This is a number that we have actually been paying attention to for several years at this point, all the way dating back to, for sure, 2013. And you'll notice that on that 2016-17 column that our, our students, they feel more stress as things begin to count more as it relates to their future plans. Now, the whole child committee last year made a, de a decision to modify the questions for the intermediate, middle, and high schools. Acknowledging that we all feel stress in our lives, we wanted to dig into students' ability to cope with that stress. So again, acknowledging stress is not going away in the lives of our students as they age. Ask Mr. Bernath with five children. <laughs> we wanted to move towards coping rather than how stressed are you? And so we posed these specific questions to those students. I have coping skills to manage my stress, and I learn strategies to manage my stress. Those replace that previous I am stressed or I have stress question. Again, for the intermediate, 
middle school and high school students. And you can see there that, that around three out of four students is stating that they do have these positive coping skills. Now if we take a look at the OES data on the next slide, it actually gives us very specific examples um, of that positive coping. I want to start by saying I would love to be one of that 9%. <laughs> I don't know, identify those students and figure out how they're making this work. <coughs> you can see there that, and, and basically there's, there's 1,023 students who responded to this survey last year. Okay? So as they go through this survey online, they're answering yes or no to each of these questions. Do you manage stress through physical activity? Yes or no. So they're actively responding to all of these questions. You can see there more than half manage it with physical activity, about a quarter through meditation, prayer, relaxation. I'm not going to go through that whole list that's there in front of you. I particularly like the second to last. 40% of students just simply choose to avoid drama. It's a great coping skill that these kids have most likely developed on their own. We can't take much credit for the fact that they are simply making a choice to avoid drama. Okay? Um, but again, each of, these man each of these management strategies was a positive response on that OES. Uh, I'm a little surprised in the last one that social media is exposure to a really low number. Is that maybe it's curious, isn't it? There wasn't a lot of stress from social media? Or, or maybe they love it so much they can't give it up. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. That's a great question. I also made note of that number. Now, as we walk through the next couple of, of slides, I want to give you um, just a quick run through of the best ways to look at this. Um, it's a bit of a trap to just move from 1617 to 1718, because the seventh graders in 1617 are no longer seventh graders taking that test or taking that, that survey in 1718. So the diagonal path for your eyes is really the one that's going to be the most um, representative of that class of students. Now, this is one that talks about um, sleep and how much sleep students are getting. I believe one area that we've undervalued, um, I think maybe societally, community-wide, I know in my own life, and I'm sure that you guys can reflect this as well, is that notion of rest and sleep. On one hand, we boast 90% involvement in extracurriculars. It's a protective factor. It insulates our students from potential use of substances. It's a very good thing. On the other hand, a possible unintended consequence could be the slide that we're staring at. Insufficient rest and insufficient sleep. Um, I imagine this applies to, like I said, students, adults, um, all of our community, because we're a community of what I consider sex successful people. We place a high amount of value on productivity, on success, um, and I think it is hard for us to stop doing. I see this as a growth area uh, for us as a school community. Um, I did not prompt Kristen, but I appreciate her teaser about the no homework weekends, uh, because I think that those are, are custom made for this. Kids work incredibly hard, and they get that reward. Uh, they know that that no homework weekend is coming, um, and I can assure you they're looking forward to it, because they wanted the, the four day weekend in October to be a no homework weekend. Um, they were ready for it at that point. Uh, so this is something they look forward to with great anticipation. Not only does, does something like a no homework weekend help us with rest and sleep, I think it also reduces some of the stress associated with school altogether. And it allows students just that opportunity to disconnect. I've also encouraged my staff to do the same thing. Um, and I think it's a good lesson for us to just take a break um, from burning the candle at both ends. Let's walk into tobacco use. You see here, uh, this tobacco use statistic is looked at as last 30 days use. You see um, a definite spike there in that senior year um, as students turn 18 uh, and, they became, and they kind of gain that legal right to purchase. Um, not that I love that, that they're purchasing or that they're using, um, but I think that helps us understand that 12th grade number a bit. Um, the electronic vapor or electronic cigarette use, um, boy, this is, this is the one that in my opinion is the most alarming. Because if you see those numbers looking diagonally, every grade level's percent of use more than doubled in the course of a year. 
And at the school level, we saw this increase last school year. Um, at the board level, you responded, and you proposed, you excuse me, you responded to the proposed policy modifications that we made. Um, you have stiffened the punishments for tobacco and e-cigarette use, but I believe that you also made them more relevant in terms of consequences for students by getting to some of those perks and privileges that they enjoy. <clears throat> I wish we could take credit for the FDA putting these companies on notice. <laughs> and maybe they're just streaming our board meetings. <laughs> but that could be a stretch. Um, that said, I'm, I am hopeful that even the increased governmental oversight of this industry will make it more difficult for students to obtain these devices and then also less popular for them to use them. If you've seen some of that information, um, the, the manufacturers of the Jewel have actually pledged to discontinue their social media presence. Um, they're trying to make it more difficult for students to make bulk purchases online. <coughs> they're, they're taking some steps as directed by the FDA that we can all cross our fingers and hope pay off. Matt, let me ask you a question as it relates to our curriculum. I know with the Too Good for Drugs program, there's a lot of enthusiastic um, responses, responses about that program. I also know it's conducted in health classes. I know and those typically are 9th or 10th graders. Right? Mm -hmm. So we've got, we've got higher numbers in the, in the upper classes. And frankly, I, I think, and I don't know, you, you may have a different perspective, but I don't think we were talking about electronic cigarettes three years ago. We were talking about so the kids that are now in 11th and 12th grade probably didn't have that as part of their curriculum. I would think that that's correct. Early yeah. on. So my broader question, and one I'd like us to think about over the longer term, is uh, relates to, are we doing enough with the curriculum if it's just in the health classes? And I think I know the answer to that. In my opinion, I know the answer to that. And so the next question is, what else can we do? Yeah. Uh, and something that I think we, we need to look at. I, I agree with that comment. Um, I do think that, well, again, I hope that <clears throat> that we will see that education translate into a, de a decreased percentage of use. I think it's also helpful to explain, um, and, and you might have, there's a good chance you were at freshman year orientation, you know, with, with Ethan being in his freshman year. We hit this really, really hard with parents at freshman orientation. Um, we hit this really hard with students um, you know, at the high school level, and I know the other buildings do very similar things. Um, <coughs> at the, those first five days of school, you know, we come back and, and we see physically, face-to-face, -face, every student in the building um, in their English classes. And one of the things we do with them is we give them policy updates. Um, and so we really um, brought up this topic um, of jeweling and e-cigarettes. Um, you know, from a personal side of things, Scott Carpenter and I have both been impacted uh, by long-term tobacco use of loved ones in our families. Um, I think just about anybody um, in our country can say that. Um, and so we, we hit this pretty hard to start the school year. Um, is that enough? No, I'm not sure that I would ever say anything is enough. I agree with that comment. Um, so perhaps one of the outcomes of this conversation is to really look at the expansion um, or inclusion of, of this content at those additional grade levels as we make their way through. Um, I know that Too Good for Drugs at the K-8 level is not it's not constrained to that health, health class model, right? So my kids, kindergarten, first, second, third, they don't have a health class per se, but they're getting it through uh, Mrs. Thatcher as she works with teachers in classroom guidance lessons. Um, so I think the expansion of that type of a model um, is, is called for. Yeah, I think you're right. I, mean, I certainly hope and suspect we'll see the long-term impact of that curriculum because we're, we're doing it consistently now throughout the schools and just some of the upper grades, you know, you made the change and it may, be, it may, it may have passed them and they may have passed yeah. it. Yeah. Any other questions about this piece? Uh, the next data we're going to walk through is um, 30 days use of alcohol. Uh, this is one of those stats that was measured historically on the Pride survey that we were using before we moved into OES. Um, and the information that's contained in that results packet um, that was produced by OU, uh, but then also on the screen, it really confirms 
a lot of what we were seeing. Jeff mentioned that idea of, of taking pause to identify trends um, and then moving based off those trends. For years now, we have seen the results come back that students most typically use on the weekends at a friend's house, on the weekends at a friend's house. That is how they're responding to survey questions over and over and over again. Um, you can see there that the use um, is, is pretty consistent from, from senior class to senior class, again, junior class to junior class, but we see significant jumps as students move into that 13, 14, and then 15, 16 age groups. In fact, that 15, 16 age group is the one where we typically see uh, the onset of use. It's 15, 16, followed by uh, 13, 14. Those are your two top tiers in terms of ages. That those are the high school years. Uh, I mean, that's, that's eighth grade into ninth grade, and that's ninth grade into 10th grade. Um, that's where we're seeing the, the highest use um, or initial, initial use by our students. Um, in terms of marijuana use, this is actually a number that has been very steady. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of the violent volatile movement excuse me, um, that we saw uh, a couple of years ago with, with alcohol use. We saw a, a big spike, but again, that was one of those things where you, you slow down, you take a look at trend, um, and then you establish a course of action based on that trend. But again, this is one that has not seen a lot of variability from year to year. Prescription drug use does not measure past 30 days. It actually measures lifetime use. Um, I've, I've given you the examples there at the bottom of the screen. Those are the examples that OES uses in terms of uh, specific examples for students to read. <coughs> but that lifetime is defined as, as having been used one or more times. This is also similar to marijuana. It's not one that we're seeing tremendous volatility. This is one that has been more static um, over the last number of years. Mental health is, is again, similar to the Juul. I, I would put the e-cigarette use and this mental health information um, as my two concerns that are primary. Um, you'll note there that, that we, we could not retrieve that 7th and 8th grade data. We've got requests into um, the folks at OES um, and we're waiting for that data. We will update you when that is, is reported back from them to us, but it simply was not available to us. Um, but you can see there that, that this is statistics that talk about students who have seriously considered suicide during the past year. And as Ms. Deeds mentioned earlier, uh, the note on the bottom of that screen, and this is just context, is that this question did not receive a response on 372 out of the over 1,000 surveys. So this survey does not require you to answer every single question. So students choose not to answer some questions. It's rare, as you make your way through the packet produced by OU, it's rare to see a question that all 1,023 students responded to. For one reason or another, they simply made a choice not to respond to a question or more questions. Um, this one, the end size is simply dropped down to about 730-ish, 750. Um, again, that's just context. It's not saying don't take this data seriously, uh, but just understand that those numbers are out of uh, that 1,023. Now, on the support side of the equation, we, we saw consistent numbers uh, similar to what we saw last year in terms of students who saw a health provider for mental health problem within the last year. If you were to average those things out, that, that's pretty close to 30% of our students who are seeing a mental health provider <clears throat> within the last year. So we've got some, some concern for the suicide side of the equation, and I think it's well-founded concern. Uh, but we also, I would just use the word, I, I'm, I'm somewhat relieved and encouraged um, and hopeful that, that the same percentage of students who is considering suicide is also included in this percentage that's seeking help for that. Maybe. Yes, not necessarily true. Right. Not necessarily true. Hopeful. I'm hopeful that's the same yeah. students. Yes. Did, they, did they define what mental health problem is? I mean, could they be seeing a they provider for ADHD, 
you know, medical, yeah, so it could be um, a medical slash oh, yeah. mental health. Yes, it, it very well, yes, it does include that piece. Mm -hmm. In fact, at the bottom of that slide, you'll note there that the healthcare provider for a mental health problem, they've included doctors, nurses, as well as therapist, social worker, counselor. Um, so they've, they've embedded some of that medical professional into this mental health professional. <coughs> I'm not sure if it's possible, but I also be interested in the slice of data by looking at what, how many of the ones that are seriously considered suicide are, have been the ones that see that. I'm not sure if you can get the data that way or something like that. We were going to ask for that. Yeah, yeah. We, we were thinking along the same lines. Yep. Um, so just some quick summary statements. Um, Students attend, high school, attend school at high rates. They feel safe, they feel supported, they feel connected. Um, they have, overall, generally speaking, positive school experiences, but they face challenges. They face challenges with things like rest and sleep, with stress, with substance abuse, and then also with mental health. Um, our action items, um, and, and to be honest, we could have made five slides out of this to-dos, um, because I don't, I don't know how you stop making to-dos with this type of information. Um, but we want to continue the implementation of the following things. The random student drug testing policy. The revised board policy re related to tobacco um, and e-cigarettes. The Too Good for Drugs curriculum. Friday Night Lights events. These Friday Night Lights events are designed to give students a substance-free alternative. Um, we offer them at the high school once a, once a quarter. Um, it's totally free to students. Um, the fall event uh, for the last two years, which has been the most popular, was um, an ultimate frisbee tournament um, on the football field following one of the home games. Always really well attended. I mean, if you came over, you'd see 150 kids out throwing discs on the field. It's really fun to see. We feed them pizza, we feed them some wits, um, and they have a really fun time with us. Um, no homework weekends, I think, is something to continue to implement. Things that are specific to, to, uh, to certain buildings. My inside connection, I mentioned earlier, from the inter intermediate school. The Pax Good Behavior Game um, at, the, at the elementary school. Um, and then this year we brought in Calm Classroom. Uh, Calm Classroom is something that we are actually implementing with our staffs first. But at each building, um, we had about 50% of the staff members offer to pilot this with their classrooms. Calm Classroom uh, is essentially a, a mindfulness effort that reduces stress and anxiety. Um, in an ideal setting, you practice uh, Calm Classroom two to three times per school day for approximately two to three minutes at a time. Uh, there is a facilitator's guide that our teachers use to walk students through a meditation. Um, it's something that they can do seated at their desks. And I will tell you that you would be shocked by the number of students who are requesting Calm Classroom because they feel the benefits in a very real, tangible way. Um, so we'll be curious to see what that does in terms of impact for these members. We need to continue, as we're doing, to monitor statistics and data through these OES surveys and through exit surveys. Um, I was in communication today with the folks from OES um, to work out our administration timeline for this instrument this year, so we'll be taking care of that um, here in the next four weeks, um, is the goal. But then, uh, additionally, the school council are researching the science of suicide curriculum for potential use K-12. I want to compare this to Too Good for Drugs. We know that we were doing substance abuse education at every building, but we didn't have a coordinated, consistent approach from building to building that enabled us to build off of what was previously taught. That's the same situation with signs of suicide. We're doing the instruction. The counselors are in the rooms doing this work, but we don't have the coordinated language that Too Good for Drugs brought us in the substance abuse arena. So the school counselors um, are pursuing more information on signs of suicide, working through the different training modules with Nationwide Children's, with the hopeful implementation um, of that program starting next fall. Um, there are still bugs to work out in terms of training dates, but that's that, the, the goal in mind. And then the final thing would be ongoing awareness efforts. Um, the whole child still continues um, to work through a lot of this information. Travis Morse is actually um, going to be spearheading the creation of the Well Notes for us this year. Um, Travis was a great addition to the whole child committee uh, a year and a half ago um, and emailed me last week and said, I'm your guy if you want someone to spearhead this. Um, so that'll be starting again very quickly. And then also, as you know, um, Jeff has taken the lead on the Wellbeing Task Force. Um, I think what we found during the random substance use 
testing conversation was that the more we talked about it, the more the community cared about it. Um, so we have to continue to put this at the forefront for our students. Can I answer any questions? I, I have a question. Can we go back to the um, students feel stressed in school portion? <clears throat> The way the question's asked, do, do we delve into, are they, is the stress coming from school? Or I think that's a, yeah. a serious consideration, or is the stress coming from home, an outside factor? Yeah. Especially, as you said, the older they get, the more important you know, testing and grades and things are. If you listed um, possible sources of stress and said choose a possible source, our students would look at you and say yes. <laughs> they, they really would. They, they, have, they feel stress from all areas. From self-imposed stress to right. parent demands to I gotta get into college to uh, it's, it's all of the above. Um, I, I will take a look and give you a page I just, I just was curious. Yeah, yeah. I, I will give you guys a page number here before we leave tonight. Um, but I am 99% sure that that's one of the, the results that's that's laid out in this OU report um, to point me in that direction. And then as a follow-up, is there a way to increase on the calm classroom participation by our staff? Well, <clears throat> what we did, because we did not want to add another initiative late. We did invitational only. Okay. And we were pretty pleased with the response, but as you will see, it will become less invitational and more of uh, a required part of the school day for students and for staff. I just, I just think my work in behavioral health, like you said, two or three minutes, yeah, a couple times a day, knowing it's there is going to be helpful. Yeah. I, I would think for the for the students. Yeah. And, and the teachers as well. Yeah. And so at each of the at each of the voting levels, we have integrated home classroom into staff meetings, department chair meetings, team leader meetings. Um, we, we have taken a we I, we have taken a good hard look um, at the way that we do these things, and um, I know Jeff at the, at the cabinet and leadership level um, is is kind of modeling what he wants to see uh, from this. So it's definitely something that's taking root. Uh, we've, we've actually been in communication already with um, the folks at Our Futures in Lincoln County. Um, they are the ones that facilitated and paid for all of the training um, for the county in August. Um, we've already organized some dates with them for next August because we, we were a host site for those trainings. Um, so we're already uh, booking things for next year to continue to move this through the county. And I'd just like to, excuse me, Thomas, I'd like to commend the administration for reaching out to resources that Lincoln County has because I think people would be surprised at the number of quality programs that are located in our county that tie into the well-being task force and this whole idea of when we looked at these surveys. So I think it's great that we're reaching out to them because they're available. Yeah, we, we, we had a great meeting with LAP and their representatives who deal mostly with the school age uh, population really just trying to make sure that there's a bridge. One of the things that we found and we struggle with is, you know, we know information, they know information, but never the two shall come together and impart, you know, what they know together. And so we've started to build some of those bridges. And I think, you know, one of the one of the byproducts of one of those conversations was the systematic approach for science and suicide. And so. Um, those are those are the types of byproducts that come from that collaboration. We'll continue to do that.
So one of the things that we were looking for um, in the fall as we had students um, who were completing their, their consent or their opt-out forms was, well, what is this number going to do from year one to year two? We, we had more students opt in in year two than we had in year one, opting into that drug testing pool. Um, uh, I think the procedural uh, things are really going very well. Um, last year, Jeff was in my office for a conversation. Um, and at the end of the conversation, this was a couple of months into testing, I said, Jeff, would, could you tell that we were drug testing today? And he said, no, I had no idea. Um, I, so I think it's going very well. Um, the, the parent response um, has, been, has been positive. I, I think when you give a community the ability to choose, the people that have no interest in it, they, there's not a complaint to lodge. Um, and so they're simply going to choose not to participate. Um, and that's, that's perfectly fine. The people that do choose to participate, we're only getting supportive um, conversation with because they chose into it. They knew what they were signing up for. Um, and they wanted that as an element for their student. Um, one of the things that I think is misleading about drug testing is that people look for a high volume of students caught. When the, the goal is that you have a low number of students that have, that have been you know, testing as having a substance in their body. Um, and that's what we're seeing. We, uh, we have worked with SportSafe um, on the process. Um, it's, it's a really well-run process. We uh, give them our dates in advance. Um, so SportSafe knows every testing date that we're going to use for the entire school year. I will tell you that we're not creative with some of them. Um, and I will tell you right now, for the whole free world, the Monday following prom, expect a random student drug test Monday morning. The Monday following homecoming, expect that test that Monday. Um, we want students to use it as an excuse not to use. And so if they're at the homecoming after party or the prom after party, we want them to know that it's coming on Monday so they can use it so they don't have to use that night out of pressure. What, approximately, what is our opt-in rate? We are just over 50% right now. Now, keep in mind, that rate moves through the year. So we have a fall influx of students and then winter sports, um, we have mock trials starting at a different time, we have academic team at a different time, we have spring sports. So the number moves through the year. The fall sport, um, and we actually just finalized all of the winter stuff um, last Thursday, so I don't have that update yet. Um, but at, at the fall sport time, we were over 50% of the students had opted in. Anything else? This is not part of uh, Matt's general responsibilities as a high school principal. Um, it's another duty as a sign because he's passionate, um, he cares, and he has a really close window into you know what students are doing on the middle school, high school campus. And so he's, in, in, to quote, remember the Titans, he's the perfect guy for the job. So. Um, <laughs> That being said, we are going to touch on the well-being um, uh, task force during board discussion. I do have a document that the counselors put together that I passed out at that meeting, so you'll get a little bit more information from them as well, just kind of related um, to what was presented by Matt. So um, next we go into, and this is going to be a very, very short presentation um, because Quite honestly, the General Assembly has been not busy because they're campaigning. Um, oh, I have one. Can you go to the other? I have to go to the other Okay. So, um, as you that's fine. All right, uh, as you know, um, OSBA gives us policy updates, and, and really there are only a few that are recommended changes or have been revised. Uh, what you'll see there is um, authorized signatures, that's really related to tax and, and official signatures related to tax documents. So there's been an update to that. Um, Student staff relations, uh, fourth one down. Um, there's been a little bit more recommendation around social media. 
and um, how teachers or staff interact with students related to social media, obviously, as uh, the licensure code of conduct and the Office of Professional Conduct. If more and more cases, they try and revise and, and refine the policy language um, to try and get a little bit more specific about what people should and should not do related to social media, but almost all the changes related to uh, JM and uh, GDH were related to social media um, policy changes. Okay. Uh, and then uh, JHH is notification of sex offenders. That's a required policy, and it really is outlining what schools are responsible for communicating or not communicating related to sex offenders and where they can get information. So it's just an update and a required policy there. Um, and then all the other things are just simply uh, uh, statutorial change or an update related to a policy in some other uh, policy language that is a reference change. So nothing um, that is significant from a challenge or a change of practice for us. <coughs> so it's pretty short and sweet. I would say the, the thing that we'll prioritize the most after the second reading is that communication about staff and student relations. And we are constantly on uh, Tanya a couple of years ago. So it was last year that you went around to each building and did your social media um, yeah. tutorial. Just kind of do's and don'ts uh, because social media is interesting. And I'm not, I'm not saying it from a, a negative standpoint. A lot of these things are really kind of um, not easy things to decipher. So I'm a staff member, but my daughter is also in the school. So I have a parent role and a, st a staff role. And so where is that line from a policy standpoint? You know. If Lily, you know, is texting something to a friend and I see it, but it's a violation of the, of the code of conduct, you know, all those types of things are kind of the the bright lines that they're, they're trying to draw that aren't bright. <laughs> so uh, that's the challenge. Okay. It's short and sweet. Again, they were busy campaigning. Yeah. We'll keep it that way. Now I will tell you that in Lane Duff. There, are, there may be some things move, uh, that move relatively quickly. And um, so we're kind of watching that. There are a couple of things out on the horizon. Graduation requirements. Uh, you know, Mike's going to talk about the school funding formula. That's not going to happen in Lane Duck, but that's going to happen in the budget cycle. Um, so there's a lot of things in the next six months that are going to require our advocacy and our perspective to be shared with Columbus. Okay. Anything else? Excellent. Thank you. And then I can queue up. trying to craft a school funding solution 
in the six weeks that they had the bill while it's in the, the house was a virtually impossible task. Um, and so what they committed to do was outside of the budget process, was to put together a process for developing a new school funding formula. Um, the work began about a year ago, um, last November. Um, representatives Captain Patterson and several other representatives um, have been involved, including um, Scott Hyde. And what they appointed was um, 16 members out of the practitioner community, eight superintendents and eight treasurers to serve on eight different subcommittees um, to do the work of the work group. I am not one of the eight members of the treasurer community who's on the work group, but I have been working with about five of the eight subgroups um, in providing consulting work and technical expertise and development. <coughs> Um, where we're going. So what I want to do today, um, it, we've had a series of meetings around the state, um, getting feedback from superintendents, from treasurers, from board members, is to go through an abbreviated um, version of that. Um, the sessions have generally last about two hours. I am not going to take two hours. Um, this, will, this should be about a 15 or 20 minute walk through that just goes through the basics of where the committee is right now. We'll talk a little bit about what we hope is going to happen over the next couple months and as we move into um, the budget cycle. So the goals of the committee is to build a system for today and tomorrow's children. Not to look backwards, but to look forward. Truly identify something that has not been done in a long time, and that is what does it cost to educate a child today? develop methodologies that equitably shares costs between the state and the locals, taxpayers, have a system that will work when there's money and when there's not money, um, and, and so it's scalable. And then to recommend a process so that if a new model gets adopted, that it can endure and can be updated over time. So that, that uh, word there, like equitably shares costs between the state and local taxpayers, a little bit um, what's the way equitable is in the kind of the eye of the holder? It is. Who, who's the makeup and how is that, how does that work out, right? Because again, for districts like Vanderbilt versus other districts that are in their city and so forth, that equitable sharing is different. Right, and I'll actually get to that towards the end as, as we talk about the state and local shares and okay. where we are and kind of the policies that we are doing. Yeah. At that point, I think it'll become clear. Great. A key number that we really have focused on through this is 2031. Um, this came out of an early meeting that we had back probably December, January. Um, Tom Hostler, who is the superintendent at um, Perrysburg Schools up in near Toledo, he's the, one of the superintendents on the committee. And, and really, the 2031 is today's kindergartners that we're, that we're walking into the schools. They are the class of 2031. And so the focus has been that we need to be addressing what those students are going to need when they walk out of high school in 2031 and, and looking at a funding system that addresses those needs. Um, and so that really has been a big focus um, that we have concentrated on through the process. Um, what I do want to do is give a very brief history um, of the funding structures that we have had in Ohio. It's important to note this as we move forward um, because you'll see there will be things in what we're, for, what we're looking at recommending that are going to look kind of like things that we've done in the past. And it almost has to. And that's because when you take a look at our past funding structures, that we've had, if you're going to have a foundation type system where you have a base cost per pupil that is then split, there's only about five different ways that that's done around the country. And we have tried four of those five in Ohio over the last 20 years. Um, and that's why when I say that parts of this may look familiar, is because, it, again, it has to because we've tried everything. Um, if you look at, uh, there's an outcomes-based approach which is measuring student achievement and then what it takes 
in the districts that are reaching certain levels of student achievement to actually reach those levels. Um, that's the noted Augenblick, which came out of the original Drolf um, stuff back in the late 90s, early 2000s. This is called the successful schools model. The problem with that type of approach now is that over the last 10 years, the state has had a really hard time defining and sticking with a de definition of what it means to be successful. You know, they change the bar every year or two, which means you can't even get a consistent data set to measure what is an outcomes-based approach. So that, that approach was pretty quickly um, <coughs> you know, kind of moved past because of, those, of that issue. There's an inputs-based approach on, on professional judgment. Uh, examples of this, the coalition, basket of essential resources, which came out of the mid-90s after the draw decision. Um, there are also elements that were in Governor Strickland's um, OEDM that, that, came, you know, that came out about eight or nine years ago. There's an inputs-based, evidence-based model. That's what the Strickland administration was. But there were also pieces of that in the building blocks approach um, that are in number four, which is the hybrid approach. Uh, the building blocks came out of the Taft administration and the Blue Ribbon Task Force from 2003 to 2004, which kind of took the outcomes-based models that had been developed, but then developed a series of building blocks <coughs> saying, Okay, these are inputs that we think will improve student outcomes and student performance. And then finally, the last one is the only one we have never used here, and that is a statistical regression analysis approach. The problem with that is everybody complains what we have now is a black box. That is truly a black box, um, if, if you, that kind of methodology. And so we, we really have not looked at that, that as an option. But what we've done, this is the only mention we will talk about what's happened in the past. What we'll try to do, take what we've learned from the past, what out of these things worked and seemed to be successful, and avoid the things that were in these, some of these approaches that proved not to be successful, and to try and learn from that as we move forward. Um, what we've learned, you know, the systems have all had positives and negatives. You know, all the four different approaches, there have been good things, there have been bad things. And again, because we, you know, we've tried all of them, you're going to see elements of all of those in what we're looking at. And again, we've tried to take the best of what we've seen um, in the previous systems and learn from what was not successful and not repeat those mistakes of the past. So how is this different? Um, it's really built around students and student educational performance and their experiences. We have looked at the whole child. This is, you know, in concert with obviously what we've done at Granville. It's also in concert with the strategic plan uh, that's recently come out of OEE, looking at not just instruction but co-curriculars, professional development, social emotional needs, which I'll talk about a little, you know, later on. Career readiness, all kinds of different things. And it's a unique model. It's built around Ohio, yeah, Ohio students and what Ohio needs are. The last part, um, and we have stress this, it is not designed as a prescriptive model. It's not a spending model, it's a funding model. It is driving, it will, you'll see measurements of things of how the resources are being driven that is not saying that's what you have to do. It's providing revenue, and leaving local control over, okay, how do I take that revenue and achieve the results that we want to achieve? So not prescriptive to the legislation? It's, who will make the budget decisions? It's not, not prescriptive, prescriptive to the local school districts. So you will see that maybe we are funding one teacher for every 20 kindergarten or FTEs. That does not mean the expectation is that every kindergarten class in the state has 20 kids in it. It's not prescriptive, it just, it's the funding level based on research that we're driving. Some places may want 18, some places may want 23. That's a local decision, and the locals will decide how to allocate that money to achieve their results. And is that significantly different than our current funding systems that has more? For the most part, no, it is not. 
Um, but the current system, you really can't identify any inputs in it. Yeah, there's a funding level, $6,020 per pupil. There's no foundation for where that, that, that $6,020 comes from, that's what we can afford to pay. And that's what, there's nothing that says, you, you add together these 12 things and it adds to 6,020. It's not prescriptive because it's not based on anything right now. This will see some, there'll be some bases, so it may look prescriptive, but that is not the intent. Okay. <clears throat> Guiding principles that we have used. Um, what does it cost to educate a child today? And what does every school district need at a minimum to operate? And as we're looking at base cost here, and starting with base cost, what we're looking at is a typical student in a typical district. So if you had a school district with no special needs students at all, whether that be economically disadvantaged, some type of disability, gifted, anything like that, no students with that, what does, what does every child need to be successful for a typical education? And, it, and really, as a core, what do we as a school district need? What do we have to, have to operate in today's environment? And so we really tried to answer those two questions. What we're trying to do is ensure that students can reach their potential regardless of the wealth of the school district, um, so that the zip code you're born in does not matter. Um, that everybody has opportunity. Again, we have stress local control over and over, that this is, you know, we want to maintain local control. We want to be transparent as possible, which is something that has not happened in the past, where it's very difficult to explain. Um, and then we do recognize that students have different needs, and that's what a lot of the subcommittee work has addressed, is students with economic disadvantagement, English language learner, special education. And they should be funded accordingly, but not as part of base costs. These are going to be add-on pieces to deal with more specific issues. Um, so what, what we're looking at is a inputs-based approach um, where we're defining the inputs of what it takes to educate a student and what it takes to run a school district. Um, one that is transparent. Everything that we are doing is justifiable based on research or current practice. Um, and and we should provide stability over time. If you look at the base cost allocation in general that the model is um, looking at, there are four pieces to base costs. There's direct instruction, classroom instruction, direct, direct classroom instruction, instructional and student supports, building leadership and operations, and district leadership and accountability. Direct classroom instruction and instructional and student support make up about 75% of what's being funded. So it is very heavily on leaning on what does it take for students to succeed and what supports do we need to give the students to help them succeed. Um, and then only 25% on what would be traditionally called non-classroom type expenditures, although with some of these I would argue that they are really not non-classroom. Um, things like electricity, you know, to me it would be kind of hard to operate in a classroom if you had no lights and working computers, if you had no electricity. We tried it last week. Yeah, we tried it last week. It made it really hard to serve lunch. Yeah. Yeah. And I know because I spent the lunch period at the elementary school helping students eat. Stay organized and get lunch when there, when there was no power. Um, so the elements of base cost and direct instruction, there, there are three basic elements of direct instruction. Um, we're looking at nationally recognized standards for grade level student teacher ratios and funding based on those ratios. Um, we are providing fund funding for what we loosely call specials teachers, um, meaning art, music, phys ed. At the high school, it's you know, more kind of some of the elective type stuff. Um, that does not mean special education, that is funded separately. 
but more of the special type program that are part of basic education. And then allocations for professional development and substitute teachers you know, to help build staff capacity um, in doing direct instruction. And when you say kind of providing funding for what you're applying, is like these needs are included in the calculation of what's required to teach correct. students. Correct. That's correct. Exactly. Yep. <clears throat> these, these are, these need, we're not telling you you have to spend it exactly this way, but it's met, the, the funding is measured by, um, the, by these elements. Um, instructional support, and, and the top one, um, we, we, had a, we had a very long discussion what, at one of the meetings. It just so happened that that meeting, coincidentally, was the day after the Parkland shooting um, that, that we had a, a meeting dealing with social, emotional, security, life support. Um, had very long discussions about what that meant and how important that was across the spectrum um, of school districts. It's not something unique to Appalachia. It's not something unique to inner city schools. Um, I actually relayed to the group as we were having this discussion one of the things from the OES survey from last year that you know over one in four of our students had seen a mental health specialist in the last year, and people were flabbergasted. They're going, you know, what, what, in, you know, in Randall, where are the issues? I said, we have issues like everybody else. They may be different. Yeah, the emotional, social stresses may be different in Granville than they are in Newark, but they aren't any less real. Um, and, and so that became an important part of the, the funding level and, and as a piece of, um, of funding within base costs. Because the term is every district needs that. They may need it for something different, and, not, and, we're not, and this doesn't prescribe what you have to use it for, but it, pro but it provides the resources um, for school districts to meet those needs of students, um, regardless of wealth, poverty, or anything else. Um, there is funding for the first time for both academic and athletic co-curricular activities, um, recognizing the importance of the whole child and, and what co-curricular activities mean to a well-rounded education um, and, and the base support. So, as an example, kind of like how that funding goes into this calculator, is that based on local differences, right? The, or is it some general calculation that has some percentage of students that the, you do here? Part, parts of this are based on specific, <coughs> you know, you will find X, it's funny, X number of positions per <coughs> student, for so many students. Okay. The allocations for, actually, the, the two middle ones here, will, the co-curriculars and also for the supplies and academic content acquisition is actually <coughs> based on statewide spending. Um, I have data, was given data by ODE of four years of spending on every line item in every school district in the state. And so we were able to use that data to come up with um, per pupil allocations. that are kind of the current practice across the state in both co-curriculars and athletics in supplies and in academic content acquisition, which includes both textbooks and um, electronic, yeah, you know, through internet or, yeah, you know, or electronic resources. It doesn't make a distinction between those. And then finally, um, for technology devices for students across the state. Um, the elements of base cost for building leadership and operations, um, allocations for principals and assistant principals, uh, per pupil building operations funding, and again, this is coming back to the, the same type data we used on the slide before, looking at um, spending per square foot per student across the state um, for operations and building support, and then building support staff. And finally, um, District leadership and accountability, uh, obviously allocations for superintendent and treasurer, which are required by law, and support staff for both. Uh, for the first time, we are including funding for EMA support. Um, that anymore is so critical um, to what the operations of a school district are. 
um, we are then providing funding for that. And finally, provisions for district-wide technology infrastructure. And this, are, this is not the devices, this is the switches and the, you know, the stuff, we, the accounting system, the student management system, and things like that, that again, we have to have, and any school district has to have to be able to operate in today's legal and legal environment and what we're required to do. So that's the base cost, and that's really what we've been discussing um, in the regional meetings in a little more detail than I've gone through tonight, um, is how the elements of base cost and what comes into making up the base cost amount. And so those are kind of tweaked based on your individual demographics, right? There's more research needs done, there's more research there that are allocated based on your districts. The, need, the special needs part is actually comes net, comes okay. third. Okay. Yeah, the first part is base cost. What does every district need to operate and every typical student need? The second piece is the cost sharing between state and local taxpayers, which is what Tom and I found earlier. Um, you know, we currently have a state share index that virtually nobody can explain, um, and even fewer people can understand if it's explained to them. Um, we are looking at moving away from state share index. Um, one of the big problems with the state share index is that every district, what happens in every district is dependent on what happens in every other district. Um, and so things can happen in other parts of the state that can make us look wealthier or poorer regardless of what happens in our district. Um, we are looking at something that reflects local capacity uh, based, measured by property and resident income um, and looking at capacity. Um, you know, as we've said before, we are, Granville is a wealthy school district and we are, we are going to continue to be a wealthy school district um, and that will be reflected in the capacity, but yeah, in a reasonable manner um, that, that reflects true capacity. Um, and finally, something that's fair and understandable. Um, it's, it's bad, um, you know, I am one of the few people in the state who actually understands that, and that's really a bad thing, um, that there are only a few people, because that really shouldn't be the case. It should be something that's fairly easy, fairly easy to understand as, as we move forward. And it's got a local capacity thing, which I understand properly, and so forth there. How is that different than the current model? The, the biggest difference um, is going to be that every district is not going to be dependent on every district. Every, every district is going to be looked at as themselves. If, if, we get, you know, if we get wealthier, it's because we're getting wealthier, not because 50 other districts are getting poorer, so it's just making us wealthier. You know, so it's really, it, it's going to be an individual district, kind of like it was before the state share index, maybe not the same way it was before the state share index, but so that what's, hap what, you know, what's measuring our wealth or Newark's wealth or anybody else's wealth is what's going on in Granville or Newark or whatever, not what's going on other places. So there's not necessarily a proposal to change kind of how the state share index is calculated. It, there it is. is. But it's only to make sure that it's only dependent on your own district. It, it, there will be a change in how it's calculated as well. Is there like a discussion about the weighting of that? There is. So that is those are all, that, that is currently, down. that is currently, on, uh, those are under <laughs> discussions right now as to how, how we are going to structure this in a fair and equitable way. Right, because it seems like that could have a pretty significant switch for Grand Bill based on the difference between our income and property value mm -hmm. and so forth, depending on the weights of those different factors in the stitch. Yes, and, and again, we're, you know, we're looking at balancing in a way that is fair to everybody without being, we, we, you know, we're not trying to penalize this but we are trying to be fair as, as far as recognizing wealth um, and recognizing poverty. Okay. Um, we had six subgroups. There were two, six other subgroups. There were two subgroups around base costs, one on base cost and one on local, state and local share. There were six other subgroups, one dealing with poverty and preschool. Um, after the superintendent representative on that was Doug Yu, uh, the superintendent in Newark was, was there. 
a subgroup on transportation, a subgroup on special ed gifted, and English, English, language, not English language learners. Um, a subgroup looking at Vertex and ESCs, a subgroup looking at open enrollment charter schools and vouchers, and then finally there was a technology subgroup. <laughs> At the end of that subgroup, we you know, kind of made a determination that most of what they were recommending really belonged in base costs. Um, and so the recommendations of the technology subgroup you saw built into the base cost part of the model. The others, yeah, the CT, the career text and the ESE is a little bit different because it's a different type of school. Um, yeah, the CTEs were looking at having a very similar funding model um, to what the base cost model will look like for um, regular school districts with some tweaks. Obviously, um, we do not need, you know, there's not need to be athletic funding at CTEC, but it's definitely, mm -hmm. you guys are starting I'm to not one to take that athletic school. football program. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, and so there are pieces, there are elements that are not appropriate, and, and so those will be, will change a little bit. Um, and so those were the start groups. Um, the key, what I want to hit on was just the key recommendations coming out of those subgroups. There's a lot more that is in here, but these are really the, the highlights. Um, from the poverty subgroup was the really a, a specific study dealing with Ohio and the challenges of poverty in Ohio. One of the things that we really did learn um, through this process is that the effects of poverty are very different in an urban setting and a rural setting. Um, you know, the, the effects of poverty, you know, the treasurer on that group who was the treasurer of uh, treasure Waverly down in Pike County, um, they have a whole different set of issues dealing with poverty than Doug faces in Newark. And a lot of that are because of available resources. Um, you know, Doug in a more urban area has a lot of resources that he can draw upon that they just don't have them. They're, they're, they don't have that infrastructure there. And, and so we really need to take a look at what it means across the different types of poverty. Um, in the interim, looking at an increase in the per pupil um, allocation for economically disadvantaged students. Second, out of that group, um, is to ensure that by the 2021 school year, uh, all economically disadvantaged four-year-olds have access to high-quality education and a high-quality preschool program with a lot more coordination of preschool services than is going on right now um, across the state. Out of the special education, uh, if you take a look at you know, right now the special education funding is primarily based on a study that was done in 2001. Uh, that is obviously a little bit outdated right now. Um, so again, a study to kind of update the study that was done back in 2001. In the interim, right now, special ed is actually funded at 90%. Um, it is funded at 100%, but take that additional 10% of money and set it aside to deal with catastrophic costs that districts are facing, which is as, you know, right now, you know, catastrophic costs, the state is covering about 35 cents on the dollar um, across the state. And so it's up to increase that allocation to deal with what are, what are the truly high cost students with special needs. Um, that group has recommended the implementation of um, the, re the recent gifted study undertaken by ODE that made some recommendations on gifted funding. Um, it was released just a couple of months ago um, and to implement the, the recommendations of that study. For the ELL, the recommendations is to, you know, right now there's three categories, is to merge categories two and three into a single one and create a new category three that reflects the fact that we have to track kids who have completed the ELL program for up to two years. Um, and there's no funding for that right now. So that would, would actually make step category three the monitoring period. Um, 
the transportation subcommittee um, is the main was, was modifying the formula and provide all districts with a minimum of 60% of calculated costs. That is actually what it used to be. Um, over the last few years, that was reduced to 50%, and now it's being reduced down this year down to 25%. Um, is to take that down to 60, and also to do some stuff with synchronous schedules, where schools are have, and this is not a big issue to us; it is in some of the more urban areas where you have schools that they have to transport to are all on different schedules. You know, just if, if the regular school is closed, but the other school is open, the same school the school and district is closed from their transportation. And they're trying to coordinate bell, bell schedules so that buses don't have to be in two places at once and things like that. Uh, finally, to restart a school bus purchase subsidy program, that program did exist prior to 2010 in the state to sub help subsidize the cost for districts having to replace buses. Um, the scholarship and charter school, um, one of the things that we'll probably get recommended is moving to a direct funding for charter schools and scholarship programs, basically leaving us out of it, is funding it directly from the state to the community schools, funding the John Peterson and Autism Scholarships directly, rather than involving us in that. Um, as also on that comes socially open enrollment is basically the charges to maintain an open enrollment system as it exists right now and do not change the incentives um, for districts to either provide open enrollment or not provide open enrollment. Basically, to set up a system that's neutral to the choices that districts make right now. Um, and the career tech, as I mentioned, using the same uh, cost model as local education. So, associations with modifications for differences in the services that are provided. Um, ESCs, there was a cost study done by the ESC Association, um, and to kind of move to a mixture of having some administrative costs funded directly from the state so that they're not charging us for their overhead costs and are only charging us for direct services. Um, right now, we are charged for both the direct services and portion of administrative costs as well. So those are the subgroups. All the things from the subgroups will get added on the base cost. Um, you know, you think of it as the base cost of spokes, and these are adding on to the spokes. Um, as far as the next steps for the committee, um, we've basically completed, or at the, at the completion end of phase one, which has been going on for a year, where we're really trying to identify what it costs and come up with base costs and to do a lot of the work in the, the subcommittees. Um, we are in phase two right now, which is further development of distribution between state and local and getting feedback on the components of the formula with the idea of having a final report available in January um, ahead of the governor's announcement of a budget which will be due March 15th, since it is a new, a new governor this year, or so that deadline is pushed back. These are the folks who are on the, basically on the, the committee, um, the volunteers have been doing this, and a lot of folks have been putting in a lot of time doing this here. A lot of these folks are coming to Columbus, have been coming to Columbus a couple of times a month for a year um, to come to meetings, to meetings on committees, um, and so, a lot of people have put a lot of time in. Um, you will recognize the name of Scott Prebles on there, our former superintendent. Um, Scott is uh, was on the charter school open enrollment. He was a superintendent representative to that committee. And that is it. Mike Dentis. Uh, a lot of work that I really appreciate. Um, one of the questions that seems to, seems to raise, at least for me, is you know, if this if this formula, funding formula, were adopted, it would seem to solve a lot of issues for a lot of school districts, including ourselves. Mm -hmm. But that, 
that also would seem to imply a greater amount of gross dollars going to education. Is that the expectation? I, I think the expectation forward? is um, we are not going to flip a switch, and this is all going to be in place at one time. Mm -hmm. um, there is an expectation that there will be a phasing period um, to get up to where we want it to be. Um, I think the key is, and one of the things we're really looking at is, you know, if this gets through the process, is to have the final product in law from the beginning. Um, the end point is there. You know, it may take four years to get there, but the end point is in law, and so all you're dealing with is, okay, how do we get from point A, where we are today, to point B, when this or something that hopefully looks like it is fully in place. But having, but having a law in place so that you're not relying on future general assemblies to implement and to build on to, but rather, what you, are, what you do want them to do is, okay, this is what we need to achieve the next step, the next step, to get to the law that's there. And so that would be the hope. Um, it seems like you've seen that like when you're changing the funding formula a little, you might change the funding a lot. We have caps and guarantees and unintended sort of consequences based on the calculation and so forth. Right? Does this have potential to have a swing for various districts in terms of the ultimate funding that they have, or what's your sense about how far it is from what's current? I, I think the hope is that it is a much more stable system. That you know, there's always going to be guarantees. I mean, there's going to need to be transitional guarantees, but there's always going to be guarantees. You're going to have things happening from year to year that are going to cause, you know, weird swings in funding levels and we need guarantees. The hope is to not have caps. The hope is to bring this thing along so that what is in law to be funded in a given year is what is actually being funded. When you look at the caps that are in place right now, the caps are highly distorted. Um, the caps cause severe problems, and what we found is once you start with the caps, it's really hard to get out from under that. Um, yeah, the caps in a way are artificial, um, and, and so I think we're looking at a way to implement this that does not require, say, okay, you're supposed to get this, but we're only going to give you this, because that's all we can afford. I think the idea is, okay, we're going to stick these three elements in this year, and but we're going to fund those three elements at 100% so that the elements are being funded rather than saying, here's the end point, it should be this, but we're only giving you 60% or something like that, and and so it's not it's calculating you should get this, but we're only giving you part of that. And I think we're, the intent is to really stay away from that. And does the model exist numerically such that you can start cranking numbers now? Or is that the next month's worth of work? Or like, I'd be curious to see how this um, out. There are preliminary numbers that we've been working with on the base cost. Obviously, until we finalize. <laughs> The distribution part of it, um, you know, deciding how much the state's paying for and how much the locals and how that's going to be determined, you know, you can't really start getting into actual simulations until until we're getting on that part. And we have been working on that part for several weeks now, uh, probably longer than that, trying to come up with an equitable and explainable way to do it that gives rational rational results without causing unwanted distortions. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot of nuance to that, um, to do that in a way that is explainable, and that's what, kind of what we're working on right now. So, just help me understand, like the ultimate outcome of this is going to be, like now the state says it's $6,000 per student per year, this is going to say, no, it's really 10000 but you only get 60 of it. Is that kind of, kind of what happens? The that is, the hope is that is not what's good. The hope is that, We'll have an endpoint, and we'll say, okay, so we can, you know, the state has this much money, so we can put these places of the final formula in place this year by funding. 
so the other pieces won't be in place. Then the next year, maybe it's these four pieces, or, or however that works out to, until you get to the end point, which is defined, which means the whole package is in place. So the, the intent is not to say, OK, the, the funding is x, but we're only giving you a percentage of that, because then we're back into caps. And that's what we're really trying to stay away from. So is there sort of an expectation though that the state share of our revenue goes up significantly over time with this formula and it's less locally driven? Um, I think that that will vary by place. Um, I think it, for the most part, um, it's not going to end up with a higher local share than it is right now. But again, until we finalize all that stuff, um, you know, we won't we won't know for sure um, until we finalize it. But that would kind of be the, you know, the intent. We sort of marked the trend of what we received recently with the, the responsibility of giving back more to the local district with whether it's good or bad is another discussion, right? Which it is, right? And for this to happen, there needs to be much more funds out of the state, which will certainly be presumably require some compensation or something like that, right? For the backup or something that's right. Correct. Is, is the work group going to make suggestions on how to reach that funding? Um, that would be my suggestion, would be yes. Um, I have been doing a lot of thinking about that. Um, some of the areas where we can make recommendations of how to generate dollars, um, how well that will be received, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but I, I would hope that that yes would be part of. I, I I don't speak for the work. Yeah, sure, sure. For the work group and and the committee. So yeah, that would be a final decision that will come out of the full work group. Um, but it is something we have, we have talked about. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Mike, thank, thank you. Thanks for your <coughs> Before we move to public comments, I apologize. We have a guest here this evening uh, to speak to us about CPEC, and, and I missed it. Um, but I'm going to ask for a motion to move up board reports uh, to precede public comments. Second. So, um, I'm concerned that me giving a CPEC update, I've asked Stephanie Priestall, who's the director uh, of district services, and she oversees um, all of the satellite programs. Um, in, in first of death throughout the county and Granville and other places and um, there's just been a lot of talk about career um, education career and education later, so I just wanted to go
middle school pre-engineering, the middle school IT pathway, and then teaches a high school course in the engineering pathway. So he sort of has a dual role for you. Um, and Craig Winning is your high school engineering science pathway, and then you have some family and consumer science um, courses running at middle school and high school. Again, just a review from previous years, Jennifer Kensley is our instructor for your visual design, and she's running uh, the courses I have listed up there. Um, and the last one, she also helps um, get some of your freshmen or lower grade level of high school through their Art 1 or foundation um, course that is required for graduation. And then two of the career tech courses that she runs are CCP courses. And this is a um, career pathway that CTEC runs that is open to the entire county. So when Mike talks about EMIS and MAT, I mean, this is one of those even more confusing levels that it's maybe a Johnstown student that's sitting in Granville that's attending CTEC. So just to keep things really confusing. Um, then our information technology program, this is our third year, year three. Um, I'm really excited about this. Uh, the numbers are starting to increase. Uh, Ryan Johnston is also eligible and currently teaching your um, couple sections of financial literacy, which I think we're already going to start to see that the students taking financial literacy with him now also want to carry on in some IT courses. Um, new this year, we added AP computer science principles. Um, with your support, um, in conjunction with CTEC, uh, Ryan went to AP training last summer. Um, we have six students enrolled in that AP class this school year, and I think that we're off to a really good start. Um, and he's doing a nice job partnering with some local business and industry as well. Uh, these courses do start um, with quite a few eighth graders, and we are really seeing now at year three, those who started with him as an eighth grader, are taking a course each year, which is the goal, that um, students start taking these classes maybe as an ninth grade student and ideally take at least three courses in a pathway. Those are eighth graders on the, on the high school schedule? <coughs> yes. Because the classes are high school schedule classes? Yes. Okay. And we Thanks. just work together on the unique <coughs> scheduling days. <laughs> yep. Um, the new business program, um, again, instructor Stephanie Stanton, we're offering the four courses up here, financial literacy, which is a graduation requirement, um, an entrepreneurship class, marketing, and business management. So um, in general, I did not look at the numbers in the Granville-owned programs. Right now, we are seeing about 300 students in the IT, business, and visual design courses. Um, and that's not including um, I don't think our second semester numbers are in the system completely. Now, keeping in mind financial literacy is seeing almost every one of all of your freshmen at some point, uh, or I shouldn't say all your freshmen, all before they graduate. So um, we're really pleased at the numbers that we're seeing. And that's, that would be basically five class periods per teacher. Right. It, it actually works up to six because we offer a number of different sections of financial literacy. So both Ryan and Stephanie would offer multiple sections, multiple class periods of financial lit. Okay. And when I say 300, I'm meaning 300 in the business, IT, and visual design programs. Those three instructors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's 700 class or whatever. Average. Um, Really, our goal is to implement real life, real business experiences. Um, currently, I'm excited to say the IT classes are working on a website for the city of Hanover. Last year, they were doing, um, actually two of your graduates are still finishing up a website and an app for the young leaders of Lincoln County through the chamber. Um, our visual design program uh, regularly is doing work with community members, but um, partners all of the time with Jim Redding. Um, in, at the high school. Um, the sign that you see as you're going up to your intermediate building, uh, that was produced by the visual design students and just really good learning experiences as they work with a client, propose things, and, and 
have that real life experience of what it's like for a client to say, that isn't what I wanted at all, and let's redo this. Um, in our business program, Stephanie's uh, working on growing an advisory board and bringing in guest speakers and potential business partners. So we're pleased at how that's moving along. Um, a snapshot of the county. Uh, Try to each of our districts um, and what they're all running at their middle schools and high schools. Um, and I've noted which ones CTEC. Uh, noted which one CTEC is running at the schools, and then um, obviously if CTEC's not listed there, then it's what the school themselves are running. So you'll see a lot of uh, a common theme here. Um, CTEC does not run any agriculture programs, but we are here in Lincoln County, so there's obviously still some running. Um, so those are usually owned by the districts, um, the associate schools. Um, CTEC's really taking the lead in middle school career tech programming. Uh, primarily through career connections and pre-engineering. And then we do run almost all of the IT programs throughout the county. Um, so this would, um, but you'll see that common theme at the middle school. Um, and new this year, we are out at Licking Valley in the middle school. And we added another program at Licking Heights and middle school and a teaching professions program at the high school and then the business program. So CTEC is running 14 programs in the county. Um, the only districts that we're not in at this point are Newark and Johnstown. Um, but I look for us to expand into Johnstown potentially next year. And then there's our other. So, I mean, overall I can't thank you know, Granville enough for the partnership as we've grown these programs. Um, and I think something CTEC is striving to do is how do we um, continue to offer career tech, work with our associate schools to bring it to the students in their building, and balance that out. We're very fortunate in this county that um, the superintendents do meet regularly and that CTEC is seen as, as a partner in all of this. Um, not, not all career centers have that luxury. So I do appreciate that. Any questions? No questions, just a comment. Um, and I say this quite regularly, though I hesitate, but but I, I think CTEC is uh, a best in class when it comes to the type of education that they're providing and, and the partnerships that they're forging. It's been a very um, deliberate, intentional reallocation of resources across a couple of different uh, courses in order to meet the needs of our students. And so we're constantly re-examining. So you know, Mr. Durst, Mr. Bernath, you know, Stephanie do a fantastic job of sitting down and saying, okay, how can we make this work? They're modeling problem solving every single day. Um, and collaboration and teamwork and several other success skills that I could reference. But um, ultimately, the students are benefiting from um, those types of experiences. So, well done. Do you understand the economics of a C-Tech no. versus a grand bill? No. <laughs> 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 Just like it from a top level yeah. to make sure I kind of calibrate it on. My, Mike will try and do his best to kind of articulate that. Yeah, well, or, or either one of you. Just like I'm trying to understand like when a teacher is, is hired by C-Tech and teaching our students versus when we have a teacher teaching our students. Like how that ultimately shakes out economically and for what the I'll rock, paper, scissor it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can go ahead and correct you on Okay. Um, there's it's two different models. Um, you know, when it's Christian, when it's Frank, um, we're you know, we're paying the teacher, um, but we're getting fund some funding for the state for the career tech programs that we're offering. Okay. Um, to come, you know, at certain levels, depending on the number of students and things like that. When it's CTEC that is running the program, they are paying for the teacher and the equipment, I believe, the equipment and the teacher benefits and everything. But what happens is when we have a student taking that class, essentially, for each class one student takes, they get one eighth of an F of our FTE. So they and so that they get funded on the base cost for one, you know, 
whatever their share is of the one eighth. So again, for every eight, for every eight students taking a class offered by CTEC, they're getting funded for one FTE. So which then offsets their cost to pay for the teachers. And the state share index for CTEC is determined based on the county average. It's based or something like that. It is based on the average of all of the local districts that are part of the C the, yeah. the JVS. Okay. Yeah. And so, the state has broken career tech into different funding categories right. based on the pathway that you yeah. choose. Yeah. So like the career connections are the category five, so the lowest funded, but obviously if the student comes to CTEC, it's simple. They're there with us all day, we take the 100% of that student. The satellites, it starts to get a little confusing because it's by period. But, but even when even if our students are there all day, in calculation of the state share index, they count for us. Right. Yeah. So they're counting 100% for us in the state share index, but for funding, it's we, they get 100%, we get 20 Essentially, each of those kids is one than 120%. Okay. They get 100%, we get 20% for the ones who are actually physically at right. the CTEC. How, How many is that this year? At CTEC? Yeah. Yeah. How many CTEC? Yeah. It's only had about 20. 20-ish, 22. That's only about 20. That's the record. Yeah, that's no, it's, it's definitely it's two right. years. It's juniors and seniors. Yeah. yeah. So the two classes. That's, 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 that's more score. than normal. We tend to see them in certain programs at our school. Our electronic computer technology, our engineering. Um, I would say those two are our highest. Digital throws some in. Yep. So we definitely see a certain um, groups of students that want particular programs on our campus. I mean, it's just. Like I said, Jeff, Jeff is in Colorado, right? We have that resource in our community and be able to connect into it with these different models. It's just fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. I just wanted, also, regardless of whether or not CTEC or Grade 12 owns the school, it's still Stephanie is in charge. <laughs> I mean, like, she has to keep track of it and report back to the state for it and things like that. So, you know. I miss that college class, Nina Spinelli. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're better off because of it. <laughs> so, yeah, so just anyway, regardless of whether or not CTEC owns the school, it's still Stephanie in charge. I mean, like, with everything that's going on, which I think you know, is remarkable, but, you know, I'm just so proud. <laughs> and it, it is nice to work with the principal. I mean, obviously, I have to have a partnership with the principals at every one of these schools because. Yeah. I need their input, but ultimately it's CTEC going out to do all of the um, OTES evaluations and take care of all of that. So I uh, just travel the county and uh, pop in everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are now at the point in our agenda. We'll entertain public comment if there's anyone who wants to make a comment. Please step forward. Seeing none. Uh, let's move into uh, board discussions. Um, two things on the uh, on the sort of table tonight, although obviously we'll discuss it in one. But, uh, first is just sort of a general reflection on the post lighting discussion. Um, Frank, we're still waiting for the results to be certified. The results will be certified according to the uh, Board of Elections on November 27th. Uh, and then, um, so after that, then I'd like to have a little bit of discussion on the well-being task force. But first, if there are any comments or observations, uh, post the levy discussion related. Go ahead, Joe. First, I'd like to say <laughs> that um, once it's certified, uh, yeah, I want to remind people that the phase-in of this revenue is very slow. It doesn't necessarily impact our outlook for this year. I've already had starts of conversations about, you know, this or that. And so we need to be very um, aware that our financial outlook for this year has not changed. And, and so um, we need to be communicating that to just about any one of our numerous constituents. So just keep that in mind. I think that's a great Obviously, the final election results are certified as we hope they will be. One of the things that I think we can take away from this is that uh, the fact that we have been uh, very open, transparent, uh, fiscally responsible in terms of uh, how we utilize the resources.
resources that the community gives us uh, is an important factor in, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, we will have to, as, as it became apparent in, uh, in Mike's discussion on the Doug Patterson um, working group, uh, you know, school funding is an everlasting challenge in, in this state and in, in every state probably, but certainly in this state. Uh, so we'll have to always work to stretch every dollar. The other thing I will say, and, and we'll, I know we're going to invite for hopefully commendation at the December meeting, the Living Committee. I can't thank those folks enough for all that they did. Um, I paid was on that committee. Um, there were so many people who gave of their time, their talent, their treasure, and the contributions, and just consistently were out there with a fact based, open, honest campaign. cleanest classes levy campaign I've ever seen in my years here. And I appreciate it. I also appreciate all the work that the administration did to, to put the facts out to inform people to show up anytime the folks had questions and respond anytime the folks had questions. It's uh, to me one of the hallmarks of, uh, of this community and certainly of, of this administration is how available you are to talk to people and, and share information. constituents in the community as much as possible what we're doing, why we're doing it. Because once they, and I think that's shown by the success, hopefully that's one of the things, the success of that. And that was we were able to get the message and the needs of the district. And going forward, I hope you know that, that we continue to do that. Because um, I think, I really do believe we are transparent, but I think we there's a difference between communicating it and necessarily being transparent, at least in my simple mind. Mm -hmm. there's, there's two different ways, things to do. The more, the more we do that, I think it's easier for the public. They might not ever get the funding formula. I don't know if I ever will. Mm -hmm. But if they understand though, our needs and why we're doing things, I think it makes it that much easier um, to what, what the district is doing. Well, and, and what you just experienced with Stephanie being here, that was a way to increase service to kids at a cheap, at a lower cost to the taxpayer. So, I mean, that's a perfect example of how we reallocated a position, got a different type of program that met a need, and did not, you know, spend taxpayer dollars on doing it. And, and so, I, I completely agree with you, Fred, just having those, those constant talking points of ways that we have done uh, the great work of the school district in the best interest of the taxpayer dollar. I think that needs to be reiterated. I think if people are listening, there's not a lot of the ballot though, right? I think that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Five years from now, we'll be in the ballot again, right? <clears throat> For sure. I don't know how to, I don't know better with that, right? I mean, it's one thing to be communicating and transparent and so forth, which are different nuances, but like, there's a listening part of it as well. And I'm not sure how to I think engage it, that. I think uh, we, at least from an administrative side of the equation, looking at that campaign, we took away some things that we thought we could now communicate differently. Um, I mean, their social media campaign and, and the videos that they produced were were amazing, and, and they really resonated. They got a lot of traction. <clears throat> That's not something, I mean, we send out the Blue Ace News, we send out Momentum, you know, it's stuff that people have to read. Yeah. Maybe we need to have some 
with our communication. A greater emphasis. And again, we don't have a communications department, right? So, yeah. you know, we're going to be relying on people who potentially will volunteer in kind services to do some of this work that really care about our community. Or again, even outsource. Or even outsource. Or outsource. Yeah. So there are some ways that we, I think, we've looked at internally that we, we should do some more of that type of, of communication. So it might not be, you know, that we're communicating any less. We're using it differently. Yeah, I think that, I think the point well taken is it, these different social media and way to, ways to communicate in 2018 they're different, mm -hmm. and we found out what works and what's effective. Um, and it is a challenge since we don't have a communications department, but I, I'm glad to hear that we're looking. Well, we have a great partner in Red Local. <laughs> and some others. Right. So, yeah, right. right. Yeah. And, and we found that it, it's an effective way. It's a different way. It is. But that's okay. It, it's effective. Yeah, we know the difference between the first and the second campaigns this year, right? Like, we just learned a whole lot about engaging a mm -hmm. group of volunteers and people and Red Local and more in this process and so forth. And then we need to figure out that, like, maybe it's worth it. Finding a way to prioritize the ways to use on Facebook, right? I mean, that was the thing that cost like four bucks, right? And like, if you get ten times as many reads, like, maybe that's the most effective, like, you know, communication strategy. I don't know. There must be again, consultants <coughs> or, or even volunteers that can help along those lines, kind of give us some guidance in how we do this. Because, you know, sure enough, five years from now, one point three, it's going to be a whole different scene, mm -hmm. right? Well, as soon as it's certified, <laughs> yeah. Start to message every single day and every single interaction the next campaign. Yeah. I mean, that's the life yeah. that we live. Yeah. Um, as a, and I'd like to see, way. yeah, I'd love to see a, a vibrant finance committee, right, with people from all different inclinations and perspectives and find other ways to get them together, right? Because, you know, again, yeah, the more that we can get those voices of people that really understand finances and inside and out. Like, oh, that's why I want decisions to do with, right? Okay, I get it, right? They can be real advocates when it comes to communicating the next level year, just communicating the success that we've got financially and how we're really trying to be financial stewards. It's easy to take pot shots if you don't know about it, right? Mm -hmm. We had a lot of those from, from the end of that campaign and so forth, and they sort of like, they brought up lots of things that may, may, may not be true, but certainly didn't have all the necessary perspective maybe that they could have, right? I'm not sure how to keep that group actively engaged, but it's an active conversation, so let's find a way to keep that up. No? Okay. Thank you. Uh, more to come, obviously.
terms of what they'll do with their lives. I think it has impacts uh, across the, the board in terms of uh, the choices they make, substance use and other reckless behavior. I think it has strong and significant impacts in how we address school security issues uh, and hopefully prevent issues before it ever arrives at the doorstep. Uh, so I can't think of um, anything more important than, than the work that's being done by that well-being task force. And I'm excited to hear more about it. Okay. So, so what I'm actually going to do is start at the state level uh, because uh, the state superintendent in the last four months has been, has released his Ohio strategic plan. And what, if you strip it down, 90% of it is exactly what we have always done, okay? At the local level. But that other 10% at the state level that's different is actually very intentional. And the culmination of a lot of conversation with the state superintendent and ODE about success skills. You know, looking at social emotional learning and project based learning in the context of that being part of a successful education. Um, that's a huge shift for OVE to recognize that that is part of a high quality education. It also gives us license, so to speak. Um, to continue what we've started here uh, around project-based learning, portrait of a graduate, the well-being task force, looking at social-emotional learning as a component of a well-rounded, holistic, world-class education. I think if you look back in time, you have seen the erosion of the relationship side of the educational equation, um, where you know, teachers used to have time to develop great relationships with their kids where they knew them um, intimately and could tap into that relationship in providing a great <coughs> connection to learn. And over time that's eroded because the emphasis has been on test score, test score, test score. Now, I, I have said, you know, in my past, I used to look at those uh, that data and, and really it drove a lot of the decision making. That is still going to be a part of what we do. Okay? If you look at the learning foundations, it's curriculum assessment and instruction. Assessment is part of everything that we should do to ma certify mastery of content. But what we're, we've been lacking is the outside of that ring, which is the social, emotional, um, mental health, uh, project-based or application-based learning that I think is, if you look back in our history, has been a hallmark of a great educational system that kind of lost its place. So, now coming back to what we've been doing. Um, I think much of what we've done related to the curriculum of Too Good for Drugs uh, kind of served as a model for what our, our well-being task force is doing right now. We're having great conversations, but our counselors went back and said, okay, what are we doing related to mental health and well-being? And so they put together this uh, information sheet for you, uh, just, and, and for the well-being task force, just to kind of highlight some of the universal K-12 things that we're doing, but then specifically at elementary, elementary, intermediate, middle, and high, about what we're doing around well-being. So I think it's good to you know, identify that this is kind of the current state. This is kind of the current state. And then we will continue to build on like Calm Classroom or um, some of the things that are happening like the yoga classes at the middle school, uh, where we start to build and, and get a little bit more strategic and intentional about how we um, think about our students' reactions to our environment. The other thing that is happening right now that I think is absolutely correlated to this work is our portrait of a graduate. Uh, we have now completed the portrait of a graduate initial conversations with the staff. 
And what that does is it creates a North Star for the other success skills that we want to build in our students. And some of those success skills could look like empathy or building resilience or grit or whatever, whatever is identified that fit also into that well-being task force category. And what that will do is give us the ability to create instructional frames so that teachers could articulate, okay, what does resilience look like in a kindergartner versus a 12th grader? And once we identify that, we can be very strategic in the curriculum, assessment, and instruction that we deliver to help kids um, have this, the set of success skills that we want them to have walking out of the room. And I will tell you, we do this better than most already. We have not necessarily lost that art and science blend like I've seen across the state in some areas. And that's probably why we get the results that we get now. But we can always get better. We have always had a continuous improvement mentality, and this is an area that I agree with Russ has to uh, continue to be prioritized and um, intentionally scaffolded for our, our young students throughout their time in graduate schools. So um, I'm encouraged by the work. We're being slow, deliberative, and taking opportunities on low-hanging fruit and invitations. You know, like, I mean, not to say uh, a homework-free weekend is low-hanging fruit, but Matt didn't have to go out and generate revenue for that or, you know, convince his student body that it was the right thing to do. I think they were on board. <laughs> yeah, the cell phone policy, you know, that was a little bit more of a, a, a conversation with every single English group. Um, but again, all we're doing is saying that the teacher has ultimate discretion of what use is taking place during that time period. Okay? But little things have broad ripple effects. And I think this board has been very um, not uh, prescriptive, but deliberative about what they want to see as far as um, our focus as an administrative team. And so I think the one thing that you know about me is I go slow to go fast. I build systems, we build systems to in, that will endure beyond any one of our, our legacies or beyond our tenures. And, and that those will be our legacies to pass on to others in this group. But I think this work is moving. The portrait of a graduate will uh, culminate hopefully April, May. Hopefully April, not May. Um, that will be a conversation for us to talk about at the December meeting. I'm going to take you through some of the things that I've been doing with the staff. Uh, and I, I know you'll enjoy it. But all of this kind of wraps together in that well-being, success, skill, mindset for the entire district. So that was a long-winded <laughs> explanation of where we're at right now. And there's work to be done. A lot of work. To be done. Appreciate the focus on that. Yep. But any questions about that? Um, I would just reiterate what Fred talked about earlier is there's a lot of partner agencies out there that can support Mental Health in America has been giving, doing free training for us um, for mental health first aid. Did it with our bus drivers. They said that, you know, they were fantastic. So um, it's not just about the teachers in the buildings. It's about all of our staff that impact and interact with kids. I'd just to add, there's lots of opportunities now with these organizations and these professionals in the county. They have resources that have been made available to the state. Now, they not, might not ne all necessarily fit, but the more we reach out to them, the more we're aware of them. Um, because the, that seems to be one thing the state is funding. Mm -hmm is behavioral health, which is kind of the, <clears throat> that's the phrase they use nowadays. And uh, 
but there are resources out there, and they're available locally. And, and I know at least in Licking County, we're one of the counties that has been identified for them. Now, sometimes we might not necessarily be able to use them, but more we're reaching out to one we're aware of them. Absolutely. <clears throat> I appreciate the slow to go fast, but I would also argue that short-term goals are important as well. And you know, I mean, think we've talked before about you know one year in the life of a student is pretty significant. And so for you know this to take three to five years, you know, got to worry about the mental health of the students now. So I appreciate the things that Matt's doing at the high school with the no homework weekends and. You know, the Friday night lights and things like that. Because you know, those were things, again, those were some nice short term things that you know can have immediate impact. Um, are other things happening at other levels, you know, maybe at middle school and yeah. um, well I, I I mean I Ryan and I walked into a yoga class and there were how many kids in there, Ryan? Oh, it had to have been close to seventy. I was just say fifty five to sixty yeah. somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And that was in the middle of the day? Yeah. yeah. Huh. And, and so, you know, we have that, we have the Calm Classroom that's happening K-12. Well. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're taking advantage of every short term that we can do in the context of the broader plan. Keep going. All right, thank you. Thank you. That brings us to the action agenda. And we only have one action item, and that is to identify when kids are going to go to school in 2019. So moved. Second. Good discussion. Um, and I'm going to bring Ryan up because Ryan is part of the, uh, the group that facilitates, he actually does facilitate the calendar uh, process, so you can ask me a direct question. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. <laughs> Part of your well-being task force, you know, each opportunity. Happy to answer any questions about the job. So one thing I noticed is that we no longer have the four-day weekend in October. Correct. It's been sort of the mini fall break, which numerous, numerous people expressed to me of when this happened, what a perfect timing it was given, and again, most of my, our high school, um, you know, people were talking to me about it during high school, but, you know, the kids involved in all the extracurriculars that they are, but also, you know, this college applications and all that kind of stuff, that that four-day weekend kind of hit at a great point, at a great point. So I was just curious as to why. Sure, and that's, that was really a um, product of talking to our secondary teachers. Mm -hmm. um, in that situation, we looked at, we can have one four-day weekend or two, three-day weekends. Now, for the staff, it's only one. One of those days is a conference. Um, conversion day that they have there in August, but for the students they would get now, four, instead of going six or seven weeks potentially where they have five day weeks, is, it's, is, can be draining on a student in a rigorous academic environment during that time of year. So we said take that four day weekend and go back to the model we did two years ago where it was two four day weekends that were split out so that students only had a couple five day weeks in a row during that rigorous time of the year. It's the first semester. You, you have in all the extracurriculars are kicking in, um, and then for our seniors, like you said, it's, it's the busiest time of the year. If we took a senior stress survey during that time, I would yeah. <coughs> not so imagine where the results would be very good at that point. So Where did we move that day off? Just to November the 4th. So it's, it's just parsed out so there's two four-day weekends yeah. I see it. for okay. students instead of one four-day weekend. It's kind of... Two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, I'm sorry, two, three-day weekend yes. instead of one, four-day weekend. Okay, I guess I think I was not seeing, the teacher and service day was not registering with me. Yes, yeah, teachers okay. are, yeah. they don't get a three-day weekend there, but the students can get a three-day weekend. Okay, yeah, no, I, that's what my, that's, I think that's what my problem was, because I wasn't seeing that as a, as a oh. day off. For, that wasn't registering with me, so. Oh, okay. okay. All right, thanks. So, so the question is, do you think people have a preference for one, four-day weekend, or two, three-day weekends spread apart a bit? Um, I can see people being happy with more of the day weekend. Um, particularly because they're still happening within the same general time of year. And I, I, would, I would say, um, especially our high school representative on the committee, um, talked to a lot of the teachers, and that was, that was the general consensus. I don't need data to back that up, but it, it was just their you know, educational experience saying, 
it's better for these kids not to have at that time of year a bunch of five day um, weeks around that, that you know we even look at the end of the year we're kind of hamstrung a little bit by testing and all that at the end of the year we don't really like that piece of it either but um, there's not much we can do about um, the end of the year now if the calendar shrinks like there's been some proposals for that from the state level that would really challenge a lot of this um, you have to get x number of hours in and then you know contraction and all those things that would be an interesting so. Uh, we've had conversations in the past, and I know one of the things that came out of our uh, innovation process was a year around school, right? Which I think is something that everybody wants to do. But the proposal was really to extend breaks throughout the school year somehow, right? Potentially with a few sacrifices that you can go to school the first week of June or something like that. You know, what would that do to your schedule and how would that look, right? To give you no know, longer or more frequent breaks within the school year. And I'm not sure from a, you know, again, if three day weekends are good, like why don't we have three more of them? And what would that look like? You know, when would that be? And maybe they could be no more weekends, and maybe they could be something else. And maybe, you know, I, I don't know what that looks like. I just don't well it seems like maybe there's an opportunity for creativity here in a small way. Well and we did I mean I think <clears throat> conversation was that <coughs> we did want two full weeks at Christmas. Or yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's that's like that. That we're not um, on. Cheers to that. Yeah. And, and so you know there were some things that we did kind of intentionally build, but you know we do because we are aligned with CTEC and a lot of the things that we have to do and when we have to provide services, we kind of are hamstrung as well. We're as mandated we, by law yeah, to yeah. mirror somewhat what CTEC schedule is. Mm -hmm. It's a mandate. I mean, that's just, that is written into. Now, can you be a little different? Absolutely. Right. You know, there can be small differences between the two, but and I would, know, I would, there is I an would, expectation. Well, I would love if our general assembly members, you know, stopped focusing on having school starting after Labor Day and started focusing on more of a balanced approach mm -hmm. um, and and making that more of an effort of. Uh, the policy making, but that's never going to happen because it's driven by amusement parks and, and other things. So, um, but I think the intent of the uh, innovation process was to look at a way that we could we, we could create more s smaller windows where kids had more flexibility and time. But I think it's always on their minds. It's just hard to actually execute. On the, the other feedback I could get about the calendar. Right? is either dentists and faculty with kids in the school or anybody with kids in college that the spring breaks don't align, right? And that's sort of a shame and so forth, and maybe there's nothing to do about that, but you know, one idea I heard talked about before is a two-week long spring break, right? In which case the one week would line up with dentists and, or colleges and so forth, and the second week would be the same week here, in which case I'm not sure if that's a constraint I was with the CTEC or if our spring break is the same time as theirs, and we have another week where that would be possible. You know, being the challenge is more related to state assessments because the state assessment window starts where their spring break window starts. So there's the dentist. Yeah. Yeah, you have 15 consecutive days that you can give all of your state assessments in language, English language arts. And then halfway through that window, your state window for um, social studies, science, and math starts, and you have 15 consecutive days within that to get those testing schedules in, and then that goes into the second week of May, which then becomes your AP testing week for your high school students. What's the timing of that window or whatever? Um, I'm going to be a little bit off on this, but I believe it starts April 6th next year. So the 6th through the, um, the 31st would be the the window, you can pick any 15 consecutive days, school days, within that window. So, having a week of spring break before the existing week wouldn't seem to conflict with that, other than the fact that there's curriculum that needs to be stuck in by then. Is that, is it the week before? Yeah. 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 It's or usually that, that second week. week. No. no, it's the week before. It's in March. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that would be our testing window. 
that we would choose. We would never, we would not want to test the week we come back from spring break, whether it be a five day spring yeah. break or a 10 day spring break. Or whatever. <coughs> yeah, no, there's a week after our spring break before the testing window opens. Right, so that we would, or our window opens, is what I'm saying. But when does the state, a, yeah, but when does the state window I, I think it starts the 30th, but don't quote me no, on that. But it's earlier than what we, yes, right, yeah. yeah. We try not to be on the bleeding edge of the state testing, right. just in case things don't go well from yeah. a technology perspective and so forth as well. Right, and extending after our spring break would lay right into that, and that would not be right to come back from the break. Yeah, so you know, we, we really don't want to do that. In fact, that's the word the schedule was until a month ago. I'm not sure that like this is a, I want to make a motion to propose anything different different here and so forth. I just kind of wonder about the process and if there's a way, you know, kind of earlier on or do the survey, like I don't know, two weeks free break might be just code crazy, you know, maybe nobody really wants that, right? I just hear it from a lot of well, I could be and people with <laughs> people with kids in, in college, right? Because you just never get to go. I, I would say one thing this is, and this is difficult, is mm -hmm. maybe difficult to say that it's the absolute truth. No matter what you do with the calendar, you're going to get negative feedback. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's a snow personal snow It is worse than a snow day. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I think you're right, Brian. I think, and I think, you know, to Thomas's point, I mean, and with three kids in college, their school breaks don't line up for themselves anyway. We, I don't think we can match up with that. I do think there's merit in looking at, maybe not now, but I think merit in looking at trying to match up with Denison County for only because we have so many parents in this district, right, who, you know, are working subject to the Denison calendar and we also have kids in the rental schools and it would be nice if we could overlay it. But I, I will tell you, two years ago we sat down with Denison's faculty who created the calendar. We went through a, about 12 different iterations and could not find Well, no, they can't solution. change it. We can't right. change it. Right, exactly. So no problem. The only thing we could do is get out of Right. That would be the way that we could do it to get them to synchronize, and that's a different thing. And I don't know how to survey the community and our constituents about if that would be a good thing or a bad thing. It means school in June. Like, how does that work? I think you get a fifty-one forty-nine. Right. Yeah. Okay. So maybe it's not. <laughs> right. Um, but I, I, I think, not that it's not not you know worth thinking about it. I do I do think it is. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I mean, I've always said I think we should be going to school for school week in June rather mm -hmm. than hurry to get out by May. But, you know, like we've got some time to, to do some things there. And if that lets you have more long homework and three weekends or whatever, or ways to do that, you know, I'm kind of open to what those would be like. And I'm not, I'm not going to propose that now as a change or whatever, but it would be interesting to start thinking about pushing that equation and seeing what it looks like, right? And figuring out how to get the community and staff feedback about if there's anything feasible there. Yeah, I wonder mostly from an instructional standpoint whether another two week break is desirable. That's sort of the basis of all around year round school, right? Is you can right, really go unless you really go in year round school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if you're, I don't know. Well, the, the time would have to be for something. Yeah, I mean, right. it's, right. it's, is that the right window to place, you know, something that large from an instructional standpoint? And it's the end of the grading period too, yeah. which is <clears throat> that. But again, you know, we can always take back feedback to the committee. <clears throat> like sitting here, here's, here's what I <laughs> probably taking copious well, notes. The thing right. about it is, and I, I would, you know, just to, to talk about the committee, all the things you're talking about are things we've talked about. Yeah. Uh, and the reality is the, the way the calendar is built statewide. That's not in the best interest of student learning. It's the things that Jeff talked about that drive that. So, you know, that's that's the real right. crux of the issue. Is you're supposed to follow the schedule, but it's really not what's best for kids and their learning potential. Now, there are other benefits to that schedule that that we can list as well. So, um, 
kids need breaks. And so I think you do see a little bit of those breaks sprinkled out more throughout the year um, as much as possible where within the constraints we have. So things like no homework weekends, you don't have to have a three-day weekend have a no homework weekend. Right. Right, Mr. Pierce. It's your story. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? What, what I suggest that we do is Keep this conversation going at some point uh, after the term of the year. Have a further discussion just generally on it and see if we want to provide more input to the calendar committees that do their work for next year. I think the calendar this year is a fine effort. Uh, uh, I like the four day week. I also like the, the, the two, three day weekends. That makes a lot of sense. I really applaud the two weeks of Christmas. I think that's a great number. Um, so, what I would ask if we have a motion. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. No, it's I, I do. I think we want to encourage. Yeah. 
But I, I think that's, that's the main reason is we, I would assume it's because just with more elements, the kids were going to more out Yeah. But that is driving more revenue to us since we are on the phone. We do have more revenue than that. Any questions?
number of folks in this community, some who stepped forward during the levy campaign and asked us questions about insurance and who have some expertise. I would like to see us work in the longer term in creating, whether it's a subset, subcommittee of the, of the finance committee. Um, let's, let's see if we can tap into the uh, collective experience and professional expertise folks in the community have on, on insurance. Um, you know, that's we're great idea. a couple of years away from our next insurance. <coughs> But, but um, it is our, you know, one of our two biggest increasing costs, uh, and it's an area that I think demands a fresh look every time. So I, I have no issue with them renewing the Gallagher contract. They bring in expertise that we don't possess internally, uh, and couldn't be expected to possess internally. But I would like to see us long term and yeah. create a subcommittee of the uh, finance committee or some other way to do it. Okay. Let's think that way. <coughs> How often do we bid it out? You said we did it a few years. Is there a it, mechanism that we followed? Uh, did, I, did we bid it out as a, I can't remember if we bid it out as a five year contract with an annual renewal? Five year contract. <laughs> I just, I I just, just had to We have certain bid requirements <clears throat> right. that are statutory. Yeah. And, and what's the magnitude of the annual expense? Or what's this, what's this line item cost paid? For through the insurance? I have to go back and do that. I think it's generally somewhere at a sixty to eighty thousand dollar per year. Per year yeah. I have to go back and double check the numbers. And do they provide active support during the school year other than yes. after negotiation? Yeah, they so basically they all the individual they work as the intermediary between <clears throat> Our staff and us, and primarily medical, yeah, generally it's medical vehicles and self insurance. And, and so, you know, when, when our, you know, our employees are having an issue, they call Gallagher, they call us, and we call Gallagher. And Gallagher intervenes on our behalf. Uh, and that there's no additional charge for that. That's part of what we're paying for it through the annual contract. So they're, they're our advocate. They are the insurance company. They, right, they are our advocate with the insurance company. They, yeah, they kind of get can get the ball rolling rather than our HR people having right. to constantly be on the horn of medical mutual or whoever, whoever it is. And that's their area of expertise, not our area of expertise in dealing with those issues. Ms. Davis. Aye. Dr. Corbin. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Aye. 13.04's approval for the sprinkler system repairs in the west wing of the high school. So moved. Second. I'm not sure how that got into Mike's area, but we'll let him have it. Uh, <laughs> probably should have been in the action item section. But, um, so this is just for the West Wing. We've been doing piecemeal in other areas. So this will take care of that whole block that was built at one time. Um, and we will probably have additional motions in the future um, related to the fire safety or life safety system. Um, but that's something that we didn't anticipate, but it is it is part of the three hundred fifty thousand dollars we set aside at the beginning of the yes. year to do this. You still have reason to think that that's an adequate amount to set aside. We're hoping that it's more than a, enough. We're hoping that we'll have a little bit of money to divert to a, another cause um, that we seem to have. But well, we aren't really going to know until they get in there and and start doing the work to see if is this is the largest part of it or is it yes this is the largest site section. section yeah so it wasn't the whole building it was just no it's 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 the, whole. it's the whole building we're just trying to do it piece right. yeah do it in sections this will be done on the break break or um spring break <clears throat> the problem is is our buildings are utilized so often right we have to find it because once you shut down life safety you can't have anybody in there right so now, the good news is it's the academic. So we can try and get 
you know, a lot of it done during the break, but um, it will be interesting to see once they get in there, what else happens. And <laughs> kind of like a ripple effect. Once you touch one thing, something else you know. Yes. I think there's a movie called Money. <laughs> yeah, you can tell us the same thing. Oh,